lady came to a pastor and said, Pastor, got a serious issue with pride. I said, what's the problem? She said, every day I stand before the mirror looking at myself for two hours and thinking how beautiful I am. The pastor said, that's not pride, that's just imagination. <laughs> Shall we pray? Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That I might know you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. That I might know the hope to which you have called me. Teach me, O God. And this fourth year to walk in that hope. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What this morning the Lord pulled the rug from under my feet. For once he did not turn up at four. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I didn't tell this to anybody, but he didn't turn up at four. Maybe he's saying in the fourth year, first Sunday, I want to be preached by faith. It was easy every Sunday morning when he came up at four and it all fell into place. You know what? Today I was struggling. Nothing was falling into place. He didn't turn up. He was there, but he wasn't telling me anything. So the question I have to ask you today is, if you only have 12 hours to live, it's 11, a 12 hours to live. What would be there in your priority list? What would you do? If you knew you had only 12 hours to live, roughly 12 or a little more than that. If you knew by tomorrow this time you are dead and gone, how would you change your life? He, of course, naturally would love to spend their time with their family, the last moments. Some would, of course, would be a little more spiritual, want to spend time in prayer. Some, of course, would like to enjoy their last meal. You know what scripture? Scripture shows us what Jesus did. Turn with me to John chapter 13. We are looking only at the looking only at the first only at the first seven verses. 13, 1, 3. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Read carefully. There's about only 12 hours to go. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from the God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. It was so important that Jesus took the last hours of his life to teach us something. That's why I asked the question, if we had ritual hours to do left, what would we do? For the context in which this is happening, you will see this, the gospel according to Luke, if I'm right, chapter 22 and verse 24. There was also strife or dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. 
about the context of what's happening a little earlier and what the Lord is doing. Jesus knows his hour has come. It's here. The Father has lifted his hand. The enemy has entered Judas. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be abandoned. He's going to be tortured beyond man's imagination. He's going to die. And he decided he's going to do something. To give us, his disciples, one final lesson that should be imprinted in our minds till our last day. He's saying, this is what the kingdom is all about. It was a need everybody saw. The roads were dusty. The feet were filthy. The basin was there. The towel was there. Only one thing was missing. The servant. Roads were dusty, absolutely filthy, not tarred roads, paved roads as we see today. Dusty roads, also covered with the dung of camels and sheep and goats and oxen. Filthy feet. The basin is there. The water is there. The towel is there. And there is only one thing that is missing. That is the servant. We all know the pictures as we see so many times, famous painters. And as we read from scriptures also, we understand it. Here is this table, everybody leaning towards the table, everybody's feet is out. And if it was Hollywood or Bollywood, they would give you a close-up on all the feet. And if you looked at that feet, dirty and cracked, the cracks full of dirt. No pedicure those days. Full of 12 pairs of dirty feet. Everybody knew what the custom was. Everybody knew the feet needs to be washed. But that job was left to the most lowest among the servants or the slaves to wash the feet. Only two disciples had been sent to prepare this meal. Probably they overlooked this factor. Or maybe they didn't. Because the water is there, the basin is there, the towel is there. Nobody is willing to move. And then Jesus, scripture says, after the meal is over, he gets up. Gets up. He gets up. Ties a towel around his waist. He pours water into the basin. Scripture says he rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Why did he do that? The answer is there. Before that. Two. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The question God asks us is, can we love till the end? Or is our serving in bounds? One complaint I hear always from the leaders of different cleaning teams is how people drop out. Jesus was not a dropout. Okay, he was not a dropout. He loved till the end. He loved them till the end. And there is so much strife among them. They are not understanding the plan of God. Why Jesus has come, what he is going to do. So they are already fighting over cabinet positions over there. Who will sit on the right, who will sit on the left. And Jesus is trying to tell them. Let me teach you. What this is all about. What the kingdom of God is all about. You are not getting it. Let me teach you 
And the church today needs to be retaught what the kingdom of God is all about because we have appropriated a model from the world and is passing on it into the church and saying this is the model. No, Jesus said that is not the model. The model is different in the kingdom. And look at what verse 3 says. Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hands. Everything was in his hands. Everything was in his hands. Scripture says these were the hands that threw the stars into outer space. Scripture says these were the hands that can measure the whole universe with, with one span of his hand. Scripture says these were the hands that created everything. This was the very hands that formed Adam. These were the hands that judged the first world with water and later Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. This was the hand that brought God's people out of Egypt. This was the hand that split the Red Sea for God's people to move to safety. This was the very hand that brought the Red Sea back to destroy the enemies of Israel. This was the hand that has kept us all together firm and whole till now. This is the same hand now goes to wash the feet. In hands. God of the universe is telling us. No, none of us within the body have an excuse for not serving. This strife comes within the body when we are trying to rule instead of trying to serve. First church, there was hardly any strife. But they were busy serving. And so busy trying to rule. I'm speaking specifically to young people, young men and girls sitting over here. Many who have a call of God upon your life. Get the picture very clear. It's not like what you think. It's not what like you see on God TV or TVN or CBN. Not all their programs, some of their programs. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is different and it's authentic and it's found in the Gospels. Modeled by Jesus and his disciples. Everyone who is called is called to serve. You and I are called to serve. If anyone aspires to be a pastor, let me welcome you to be the chief servant in your church. Telling you in the initial years, you will do everything which later your congregation will help you to do. In the initial years, you will have to do everything. Everything. You will have to do. And if you are not ready to do it, don't even say, God, I am here. If you think being a shepherd is to stand behind a pulpit and preach, you haven't understood what the kingdom of God is about. You haven't understood what it is about. If you think it's a Bible study, you haven't understood what it is about. You haven't understood. And Jesus is telling his disciples, you haven't understood what the kingdom of God is all about. The kingdom of God is composed of servants. And their king is a servant king. We sing that song servant king. But we do not understand what it means. Everything, everything was committed into his hands. Yet he took those very hands into which everything was committed. And he decided, I will wash the feet of my disciples. So that I will know what the kingdom is all about. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. And verses 25 to 28. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, and it shall not be so among you. But whoever decides to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever decides to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is God's Bible College. This is God's real Bible college. Not like today's graduates who will send asking, what's my basic? Do I get HRA? Is insurance there? What about transport? I'm talking about what real Bible graduates ask for today before they will apply. But no, that's not what it is all about. The kingdom is not about 
appropriating. You're hearing a gospel where kingdom is all about getting. God says the kingdom is all about losing. It's all about losing. When is the last time you saw a pastor on TV who wasn't a ball, who, who looks like a superstar? Look like superstars. They come like superstars, they go like superstars. They have their own security guards. They have their limousines. They have their private jets. They have a million dollar mansion. That's what Crystal Cathedral is on sale for now. Because they are bankrupt. Every church, every ministry that is built on false foundation will fail. Mark my words, will fail. It's already failing everywhere. Because we have not been called to rule. We've been called to serve. Called to serve. And you're hearing this gospel over and over again. No, we have been called to rule. We are called to rule over life. That's over sin. Over temptation. Over the flesh. Over the enemy. Over this world. And not rule over people. It's the Gentiles who lord over the people. And that Gentile attitude has come within the church. Where all the people are asked to is to give and to give and to give and to give to support their lifestyles. And they will use a good word like you are our partners. You are not their partners, you are their servants. You are not partners, you become their servants. They lord over you, they lord over you, they lord over you. And actually in US, a pastor said, I will show it to you, this is true. One of his radio programs, he just said, we are starting something, so please send your offerings. He said the next one week he got over $300,000. You are starting nothing. It's like that. Because the gospel has gotten so much. That the people who are giving are also giving with a specific purpose to receive even more. Because they have been told, if you give, you will also rule. You are not told you have to give to serve. You have been told you have to give to serve, rule, not to serve. And that's where the lie has come in. And Jesus is saying, that's what happens in the world, not within the kingdom. In Philippians chapter 2, and verses 5 to 9, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. Scripture says he was God. Everything was committed into his hands. But when he came, he chose to come as a servant. And God is asking us, you and me today, how have you come into his house today? Why we come? We come. Scripture says, after the meal was over, I believe he waited to see if anybody would get up. They must have sung a few songs. Scripture says they sang hymns. Jesus also sang hymns to the Father. They sang, they ate, all during the time he's waiting. Well, Peter, will you get up? Peter is not getting up. Well, I'm the, I'm the leader. Why should I get up? John, you're leaning so close to me. Are you going to get up? I'm not going to get up. What about Matthew? I'm not going to get up. What about Thomas? I'm not going to get up. Nobody got up. Nobody got up. That's the key. Nobody got up. Except Jesus got up. Scripture says, He rose. Doesn't it say? He rose. He got up. You know what? To rise, you need to be seated. You cannot rise unless you are seated. But depends upon how you are seated. 
If you are not seated at the table as a servant, you will not rise as a servant. If you are seated already at the table as a Lord, you will not suddenly rise up as a servant. That's why it's a question of the heart. How are you seated? How are you seated today? How are you seated? If you open your eyes and look, as soon as you enter in, just a little example, enter into church on any day, there are so many needs. If you are a servant, you will notice. If you are a Lord, you will not. I read this story when I was very young, one of the books my dad gave me. He said there was this lady who wanted to hire a maid servant. So, so many came. So she had left a broom on the way. The first one came and went over the broom. The second one skirted the broom and went. The third one came, took the broom, put it in the corner and went to the lady and the lady said, you are hired. Because you are a servant at heart. Getting it? That's the key. When you enter anywhere, especially the church, on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, any day, when you enter, if you are a servant at heart, you will see so many things. Foot mats have been, been placed. The dustbins have been, been lined. The chairs are dusty. The curtains are not in order. Today it is, because last yesterday I saw it was. When you leave, also you will realize there are a lot of things to be done. Getting it? But if you come for three years to the church as a visitor, there is something in your heart with which you are sitting down. Not sitting down as a servant. Sitting down as somebody else. Don't tell me you're so busy. Don't tell me you've got such, such an important task to finish. The greatest task that any man had was Jesus. And he had time to wash feet. These are the questions. Now let it relate to your homes. Young people, specifically talking to young people. When you go back home, are you so spiritual that you only read your Bible and pray? Do you help out in the home? Things that are lying around, things that have been misplaced, things that are dusty, things that are dirty. Are you waiting for the bai to come in the morning to do it all? Then how are you going to serve in the kingdom? Why well, Jesus said many are called, very few are chosen, because you don't realize you are being watched. You are being watched. That's why scripture says it's because of strife among the disciples. He decided to teach them a very strong, powerful, practical lesson. He says, where there is strife, it is because you are not servants at heart. Every marriage where there is conflict, it's because it's a marriage of lords and ladies and not of servants. Every conflict between children and parents, it's because it's a relationship between little lords and little ladies and not servants. Servants don't fight. Servants have got a lot of stuff to do. All who sit there and complain and complain and complain day in and day out, it's because you are not servants. Telling you the truth. You go back and check the record of all those who complained and grumbled. They were not servants. Though they were slaves, they were not servants. There was a prince among them who was never a slave. He was a servant. So he never complained. His name was Moses. Because he was a prince, God put him in the wilderness for 40 years so he would learn how to be a servant, looking after his father-in-law's sheep. Once he became a servant at heart, he never complained for the next 40 years. A whole bunch of people who were slaves all their life when they were brought into the desert, they did not come as servants. They came as lords and ladies and all they had was complaints. There was one among them who was a servant and his name was Moses. And God says, my servant Moses, my servant Moses, my servant Moses. He says, he's my servant. 
Does he say, my servant Miriam? Does he say, my servant Korah? He doesn't. He says, my servant Moses. Yet he was the prince, but a servant at heart. God is asking us today, three years old, as a church, a shoulder in the Lord. Where are we seated? How are we seated? Scripture says in Ephesians 2, we are seated in the high places in Christ Jesus. True, spiritually true, but he is a servant. So if you are truly spiritually seated in Christ Jesus, in the high places, you are seated as a servant. He had everything committed into his hands. If you are seated in the high places, you and I also have everything committed into our hands. But we are servants. Primarily, we are called to serve. First king Israel chose was not a servant. He was a king in the flesh. And God was very upset. He said, by choosing him, you are rejecting me. You don't know what you are getting. You don't know what you are getting. Well, God knows I am a servant at heart. Saul is not a servant at heart. He is a king at heart. He is going to create trouble for you. But after Saul is disqualified, all God has to say is, My servant David, my servant David, my servant David. You know why David is so popular with God? Because he was a servant. When we first see David in the Bible, scripture says the whole brothers are in Jesse's house. David is a servant in his father's house. He's a servant in his father's house. When the anointing comes upon him, he is a servant in his father's house looking after the sheep. When the call of God comes upon your life and the choosing comes upon your life, will you be found as a servant in your father's house? Will he be found? Think about it. Will he be found serving? It was found serving. Samuel is confused. He said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all gone. Do you have any more children? He said, yes. Where is he? Out in the wilderness. Conjecture. Did David know Samuel was in the town? We don't know. Nothing is mentioned. But do you think it is possible that this fake prophet visits Bethlehem and visits Jesse's house? The previous day already been told, get all your family consecrated, that David didn't know? He probably knew. But he wasn't told to stay back. So what did he do? He did what he always did. He served. He probably took the sheep in the morning and he left. And he was found there by God. What was missed by the prophet was found by God because he was serving at his point. What I am telling you young people today is to keep on serving. You don't need a pat at your back. It's also important how you serve. How you serve. How you serve. How you put away things. How you take care of things. You need to believe, be, believe that all these things, though they are made of plastic and metal, belong to my Father in heaven. And I shall be a good steward. It belongs to Him. Saw so the needs. You saw the prisons. You know the call for Bibles. Where is the money going to come from? That's why I'm so tough with you saying we will not spend on these things. We need to send stuff out. We need to send stuff out. We need to invest more out rather than spend on us. To the point I said this Sunday for the first time we are not even having an anniversary lunch. They have asked for, another five islands have asked for Bibles. Lunch means five to six to seven to eight to ten thousand bucks. Ten thousand bucks means I can send two hundred Bibles. <coughs> Are we truly, truly servants? When David came to King Saul's house to play his harp, he came as a servant. And scripture says for a season he was there. His brothers were in the army, he is in the palace. Now if you and I were in the palace, and then after our job is over, we go back, how will we go back home? 
What will we tell all our friends and neighbors? You know where I have come from? I have come from? Scripture doesn't say. Scripture says David went back to his sheep. Because he was a servant. And back to his sheep. Because he was a servant. He came as a servant, was found as a servant, came to the palace as a servant, went back to his sheep as a servant. Found again serving his father. And there was a problem in the battlefield. There was a giant coming and screaming at Israel. And the father sent David to the battlefield to serve his brothers. He went there with bread. Now he is serving his brothers. Now let me ask you brothers and sisters sitting over here. Will you serve each other? Will you serve? This is, these are brothers who don't like David. From the day that anointing came upon his head, they don't like him. But he is going with bread for his brothers. He is found serving. Oh, I was so busy with this one aim to go up in this world that is perishing. That is falling apart. Literally before our eyes it's falling apart. We are so busy that we don't even have time to serve. David was serving his brothers. And when he chooses to serve Israel, when nobody is there to fight Goliath, he says, I will fight. I will be the servant who will fight. He looks at this young man and says, how can you fight? This is a little fellow. How can you fight? And he says, I remember. Servants remember. Lords forget. Servants always remember. He says, I remember. You know what? One day a lion came. One day a bear came. What did I do? He took a lamb from the flock. And they went. I went after it. That's key. If you got hundred sheep, a lion comes and takes one, you will say, thank God, the 99 are sheep and my life is safe, not David. I've been committed something into my hands and I'm responsible for hundred for 99. Lion has come. I'm going to go risk my life for my sheep. I want to fight a lion. I want to fight a bear. You know what? There was a guard who was watching from heaven and says, they saying, if he will risk his life for a sheep, he will be capable of taking care of my sheep too. If he can take care of his father's sheep to the point willing to lay down his life, I can commit my nation, my people also into his hands. And every time King Saul asks him, he says, your servant, your servant, your servant. It's only because he's a servant at heart, he can go face Goliath like a king. Know why so many of us are not able to face our trials and our testings and our troubles? Because we are not servants at heart. To face the enemy, you can't face him as a servant. You have to face him as a king. But to face him as a king, you need to be a servant at heart. And David was a servant at heart. God understood. David is a man after my own. He has understood my heart. I am a servant. He is a servant. We get along well together. David and God got along well together because this is two servants walking together. Book of Samuel. When David is all settled down and he's very upset. Because he's still thinking about God. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 you will see. He's still thinking. Well, I have built my palace. But the Lord's ark is sitting there. I need to build a house for my Lord. See, now I dwell in a house of cedar. But the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. And Nathan said, go. Do all that is in your heart for the Lord is with you. It's saying like that to our friends. Are you are coming in the cycle, I got a bike. It's not good. Now, I don't want a bike and come in a bike with you. Instead, I want you to have a bike. So, I got some money put away in my bank. I will give it to you. Why don't you buy a bike? Because we are friends, right? Let us both go on the bike. Getting the picture? He saying, I am living in a house, Lord. You are living in the tents. That ain't good. 
I want you to also have a house. And in verse 5, the word of the Lord comes. Go tell my servant, David. Thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? He says, no. David, you're not going to build a house for me. You gather all the stuff and all, but I got a problem with you. You we'll leave the problem aside. You're not going to build my house. You know what? Your son will build it. Son will build. You're not going to build. If it had been any one of us, we would have been so, so upset. Look at verse 18. King David went in and sat before the Lord. In the picture, what did he do? He went down. Sat before the Lord. So we are talking about sitting. He sat before God, not as a disgruntled person, not as a miserable person, not as an unhappy person. He sat before the king, servant king, as a servant. He sat before God and said, Who am I, O Lord? What is my house that you have brought me this far? How did he sit there? He sat right there on the floor before the Lord and said, Whatever I have is what you have given me. Whatever I am is what you have made me. I have no complaints. That will tell you something that is incredible. If I am right, it's in verse 27. You, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. You get it? David the servant wants to build a house for God. God the servant tells David, I will build a house for you and you will always have somebody living in the house forever. The two servants talking to each other. God is saying, David, your house will stand forever and ever. I am going to build a house for you. God tell anybody in the Bible, I will build a house for you, except David. You will always have somebody to sit there. The very throne will be called the throne of David. Never told that to anybody. Not to Abraham, not to Isaac, not to Jacob, not to Moses, not to anybody in the Old or the New Testament. Only to David. Only to David. You know why David? Because you are a servant. And I am a servant too. We will build for each other. And God is asking us, what are we? Go back to our text. John chapter 13. Rose. He do. He. He rose. You can't get anything done unless you rise. We can have our meetings. We can have our discussions. We can make our plans. Everything. But to get it done, somebody has to rise. Call for a meeting. Anybody will come. But if I ask for volunteers to do that, will everybody who came for the meeting come to do? To do, you have to rise. And it's not enough that you rise, you also have to lay aside a lot of things. That's what we don't like. Because we have not been taught, taught in modern theology to lay aside anything. We can sit there and discuss and discuss and discuss and discuss. Do you think the world will go to the ends of the earth? Do you think most of you when you came in the morning that a miracle took place in this house in the morning, the hall became clean on its own, the carpet rolled by itself, the chairs all got life and arranged itself, the sound system. Do you think it happened on its own? When you went into the bathrooms, did you see how clean the bathroom floors were? Did you know after they finished cleaning and the worship was going on here, you know, yesterday youth service was going on here and somebody had walked and left black stains over the white tile and the Lord told me, get on your knees and clean that floor with my rag because that's my house. And I was on my knees wiping the floor because he said it is my house clean. Think it will all get done on its own. No, it doesn't get it to its own. Because there are few people who are willing to rise, it gets done. After service, so many people are so busy, they rush up. Now they are expecting another miracle that these things will fold by itself and go in. 
Do you think it will happen on its own? It won't. And have you noticed it's the same set of people doing it over and over and over and over again, week after week, month after month, year after year, and do not be jealous when the anointing falls upon them. Because anointing always falls upon the servants. And fall upon the lords, falls upon the servants. Both here. Say, Lord, here I am. I am here. I am willing to do anything, O Lord. Even if there is nobody, I, I will do it. I am there. I am there. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. Look at Ephesians 5.21. If I am right. Oh, see, put aside his garments, all that outside things, excuses, laziness, lethargy. We like 22, men especially. We don't like, we don't want to read. That's why even the editors have made a division between 21 and 22. <laughs> because all the editors were men. But we forgot mathematics that 22 comes after 21. <laughs> What does that mean? It means, let's take the word submit out and let's put the word serve there. Suddenly all the problems in all the families will cease. Serve one another in the fear of God. Are you getting the picture? Almost every problem in the family will cease. Because the husband will be busy serving the wife, the wife will be busy serving the husband, the children will be serving the parents, the parents will be serving the children, and suddenly they are modeling the kingdom of God over there. Because the kingdom of God is full of servants. Women, married and to be married ones, will you sweep and swab and wash and mop? Will you? your real MBA? Mop, bucket, agenda. <laughs> Will you? Honestly, think about it. That's, that's submission. That's where it doesn't work. But scripture comes over strife. Strife comes from verse 22 when you don't read 21. When you don't read 21 and only read 22, strife comes in. Submit to your husbands. The wife will say, love me as Christ Jesus loved the church. <laughs> strife has come in. Why has strife come in? Because they forgot to read 21. What does 21 say? Serve one another. We are a team. We are a team. Are we getting the picture? As a church also we are a team. It's not that some have been given specialized talents in arranging chairs. God never talented anybody like that. <laughs> I tell you honestly, 10 out of 10 times, if I am coming early to church and I have missed the church keys, I call whom? I call whom? Eric. Eric. Every day, every week without fail. You think he lives, lives next to the church? He lives the furthest from the church. Fact is, as a pastor, I know I cannot call anybody. And yet I know if I call him, he will be there. You all have taken it for granted. Eric will come and open the church. And that's what David said. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. When things happen in his life, don't get upset. So many needs in the house of God. There are so many needs in the house of God. So many needs. It takes pain to serve. It takes money to serve. It takes sweat to serve. It takes... God is asking, will you be there? Will you be counted? Will you be found? Will you be found? Listen, wherever you are, whichever church you are worshipping, whichever church fellowshipping, we have visitors today. Will you be found faithful? God is asking us the same question. Will you put aside your 
excuses, the outer garments. All our excuses. To put aside your prejudices. Especially if you are in other parts of the country. Thank God here we don't have prejudices. Parts of the country, will you have prejudices? Maybe we have a few believers coming from the villages. In their dhoti and banyan. And come and sit next to you. How many of you would like honestly with all your hallelujah and all, would like some members of our churches in New York or Florida come and sit next to you? Guaranteed, nine out of ten of them will be prostitutes or pimps. Or drug addicts. Touched and delivered by God. They will come and sit next to you. You take them. That's why Jesus said, many rich will not make it in the kingdom of heaven. Because they don't want to socialize. Many people choose their churches because of the society that goes over there. Not because of the truth that is seen there. You sit with them. You know what happens to my brother Sydney every week? Every week. Because he's black. And he was pastoring in a very rich white neighborhood. How many times they tried to set him up? Simply because the color of his skin did not suit their mind. Will we sit? Question, will we sit? Will we lay aside our garments and be willing to serve? And we hear, Megan, Megan, oh, we get so excited. Do you know what that child really does at 15? Full-blown age victims coming in with lessons, last stages. Passing their stool, everything. This 15 year old child cleans them up. Puts, bathes them, carries and puts them and cooks and feeds them. And she's been doing it for over a year. Question is, will we? Can we? If so, we have forgotten what we have learned in three years. It's a waste. She told me last week also, Dad, if I get more than three hours to sleep in a day, it's a luxury. I sleep three hours a day. Because I'm doing my exams. I got a little baby. I got to take care of this home. And I got to take care of the church. Fifteen years. The kingdom of God is made of service. Of service. And God is asking us, are you really serious? Are you really serious? Which gospel are you reading? Which gospel are you listening to? There's a real Jesus, authentic Jesus that pops up from the books of this Bible. And there's a false one that is preached. And they have to keep on inventing things to make Jesus fit into their image. Keep on changing. His parents were very rich. They had gold bars hidden in their house, which the Majai brought. So why was he a carpenter all his life? He wore these kind of clothes. You know what? Because they have an agenda, they have to change Jesus according to that agenda. And Jesus said, you know what? Your agenda is wrong. That's not what I am. He said, let me give you this final lesson as to what I am. Scripture says, he arose and tied a towel around his waist and said, this is what I am. I am a servant. This is what I am. Millions are swallowing the lie that God is indebted to serve me. That's why I come to church. I'm looking for a new revelation today to see how I can use God to get more. Two ways to prosperity, three ways to healing, four ways to deliverance, 15 ways to grow bigger in this world. That's all they teach. They don't teach you servanthood. Churches grow and grow and grow. And if you need to see the pastor, you need a telescope because you're sitting up over there like a superstar. Pentecostal pastors conference in the West, they said, 
We don't want any pastor who doesn't have a minimum of 1000 member congregation attending. Because that's the hallmark for success. This wouldn't have fitted in. Neither would have Paul or Peter or John or Matthew or Thomas. They wouldn't have fitted in to that criteria. Talking about real things that is happening now. Now in our day and our age. Letter of a bishop sent to his congregation who are struggling to make both ends meet. When I come to this particular city in India, I need air conditioned transport. And please remember, I eat only dry fruits for breakfast and juice. Air conditioned accommodation. A bishop of a church in India to his congregation who are struggling to make ends meet. Whom are they following? Whom are they following? I'm asking you young people, is this the image you have in your mind when you say, if the Lord calls me, I'm willing to serve him. Willing to serve him. Are you willing to put aside all this prejudices, laziness, excuses, misery. Let me tell you, to this church especially, misery. You can have gone through any trauma in your life. You don't have to be miserable. A miserable servant is a terrible servant. God says, my servants should be cheerful givers. Not miserable givers. Not grudgingly. You can't be miserable servants. Let me show you something in scripture. On chapter 19, if I'm right. We don't have lunch. We have snacks, heavy snacks, so you can relax. 19, verse 38 onwards. This is dead. After this, Joseph Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews to bury. Read Luke 24 and verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. Think about this. You want to talk about misery? This is misery. This is a set of miserable people. This set of people had followed him for three and a half years and everything in their life had been built around him. He was the leader. He was God. He was Messiah. He was going to free them. He was going to set them free. And they are going to free. And one day he's dead. Literally darkness covers the world. Scripture says darkness covered the face of the world. Darkness covered their own world. They do not know he's going to rise up. Yet they chose to go with spices and not with spite. God is asking us today, in your misery, when you come to me, what do you bring with you? Is it spices or is it something else? We serve a risen savior. They are going to a dead savior who is not a savior anymore for them. He's dead. And they don't know he's going to rise. Scripture says, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and the women all went with spices. Question I ask myself is, if I was caught in their time, would I? The question we ask is, where are the disciples whose feet he had washed? Are the disciples? He didn't wash Nicodemus' feet. He did not wash Mary Magdalene's feet. He did not wash the feet of any of these women. He washed the disciples' feet. Where are they? God is asking is, in your misery, in your darkest hours, when you come into my presence, what is that you bring? And go through any trauma, 
we can go through loss of spouse, loss of child, loss of job, loss of everything. But when we come to him, we go with spices. The sacrifice of praise. So that it will be a sweet smelling aroma in his nostrils. What do we go? Try this fourth year. Try say Lord in everything and in anything. I am going to worship you. You don't need to do anything more for me. The cross is enough. I am a servant. And I am going to praise you God. I want to praise you. I am going to worship you. There are no conditions for my worship of God. You don't have to do anything for me. If you do. Praise God. Even if you don't do. Praise God. That's what Job says. You don't have to do anything for me. I will still praise him. That's why to that man, the first revelation of the Redeemer is given book. He's able to say, I know my Redeemer lives. We sing, he knew. My Redeemer lives. Why? Because in his darkest hour, he chose to bring spice and not spite. And God is asking us, what is that we bring? What is that we bring? In Mark 12, verses 1 to 6, look at the heart of the Father, the heart of God. What does it say? Then he began to speak to them. He began to speak to them. What did he speak? What did he say? He said, A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine wart and built a tower and he leased it to the wine dressers, went into a far country. Now at vintage time he sent a he sent a servant. Come to verse 3. And they took him, beat him up, and again he sent, verse 4, another servant. And then, verse 5, again he sent another servant. And therefore still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him. You know why? Because the son also was a servant. I'm telling you today, right from my heart, God still sends only servants. If you are not a servant, you were not sent by God. He still sends only a servant. And let me tell you, the other side of what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, it's good for you that I go so that I will send you another comforter just like me. He is also a servant. The Holy Spirit. It's also a servant. God is looking for servants in his house. God is looking for servants in every house to which you belong. God is looking for servants who will go to your institutions on Monday to Saturday. Servants who will go to the office. He's looking for servants. And servants have no complaints. They have no complaints. Because they realize at Infosys, at Satyam, at IBM, at G, wherever you're working, I am a servant serving the servant king. I have no complaints. I'm a servant. The servant is always looking for opportunity to see how can I serve. And to those who go with the servant heart, God always opens up doors. So Joseph, you can put him anywhere he's a servant. And the master acknowledges this is a real good servant. Into the prison he goes, the jail warden says this is a good servant. And in the jail is sitting there and watching the butler and the baker and said, you got problems, what is it? Why? Because he's a servant. He sees the needs of others. If he was a lord in his heart, he would have sat there in the jail and sulked and he would have missed God's call upon his life. But he was a servant, therefore he saw the needs. And if you are a servant sitting here for three years, if you open your eyes and look, there is needs all around you. Don't sit there and say, come Serve me, serve me, poor me. You don't know, you need to serve me. God says, no, you step out and serve. You step out and serve. You step out and serve. That's why in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is represented in the book of Genesis as Elias, or the chief servant in Abraham's household. He is a servant. Isaac is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is looking for a bride for Isaac. The church is called to be a servant. <laughs> Elias had traveled such a long distance looking for a bride for Isaac. And the only criteria he sets is not that she should be beautiful. She should have long hair. He doesn't look at any of those things. He says, I, my servants and all these camels. The lady who comes up should say, 
I will bring water for you, for your servants and for your camels. What is he looking for? He is looking for a servant. Jesus Christ is a servant and the Holy Spirit is still looking around for a bride who will be a servant. Because only servants can live together. He's asking us, are you a servant? Are you a servant? You are a servant. So many, so many of you have a call over your life. Call over your life. The greatest prophet, the most powerful man in the Old Testament. One day, Elijah came and put a mantle around him. His name was Elisha. For the next many, 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 many years, we have no idea about Elisha. Elisha is given just one title in the Bible all those years. What's the title? The one who washed the hands of Elijah, the servant. The one title given. The servant. Who is Elisha? The servant of Elijah. He's not called the prophet. He's not called the one with the double anointing. Portion. Let me ask you this question. I often hear you asking and praying. You ask for a double portion. You ask for a double portion of his anointing. How can you get a double portion of the anointing if you haven't qualified for the first portion? Servants who get the first portion. And then when you have faithfully served like Elisha served Elijah, you get the double portion. You get. And I get the double portion. We will if we serve. And if we serve faithfully. That's why God is asking. What do you want your healing for? What do you want your deliverance for? What do you want your prosperity for? To serve or to rule? And it's for. Three days before Saul was killed. Three days before Saul was killed. David faced the greatest battle of his life. The Amalekites had burned down Ziklag, taken away everything. And his soldiers were upset. Their wives, their children, everybody had gone. David himself encouraged, came back with God, heard the word of God to go, to pursue, to recover. And when they are going, he's got 600 soldiers, 200 of them are tri- tired. They said, we cannot come. We will look after all the supplies, everything. Stay over there. The other 400 go. They defeat the enemy. They recover everything. They bring back great spoils with them, which the Amalekites had taken. And scripture says, very clearly it says, some uncouth fellows were in that group of 400 who said, we will not share what we got with those 200 who stayed there. Did they say? They said. Read 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 24. And listen to what David says. This is God speaking through David. The son of David speaking through David. 30 and verse 24. Go a little early. Let's see what the guys say. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered. Verse 23, David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. (coughs) Did you get the principle? It's not the one who aspires and gets behind the pulpit alone who gets the reward. He's in the battle front. But also those who keep and stay by the supplies. Those who clean, those who dust the chairs, those who put up the equipment, those who clean the bathrooms, those who faithfully day after day, week after week, never hoping or never even ever getting a chance to stand behind the pulpit, they also will share equally when the spoils are divided on that day by the son of David. He will say, enter into my joy, my good and faithful servant. Do you know why? For 20 years you cleaned that church in Hyderabad. Enter into my joy. You will receive what the pastor received. That's what David is saying. That's why David is saying. That's why I challenge young people when you sit over here and when you see speakers, do not aspire to get behind thinking, this is the only way you will serve God. And those who are needed to take care of the supplies too. 
Like I said, things don't happen in a church just like that. Things don't happen in a community just like that. There are so many things to be done. And each one, what is he called to? Is faithful, receives that anointing for that, and faithfully keeps on doing it day after day, night after night, week after week, because you are serving him and not any man. Getting the picture? That's what it's all about. That's what the gospel is all about. That's why Moses had to train and learn to be a servant for 40 years before he could be called the servant of the living God. Because for 40 years he was a king. He was a prince. You read any of the epistles in this Bible. Whether it is Paul or Peter or Jude. What do they say? Paul the born servant of Jesus Christ. Peter, chief of apostles, no. The servant of Jesus Christ. Jude, who is the brother of Jesus, no. The servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But today, we have lots of lords lording over his people. They are not servants. They are lords. And you study the Bible carefully, you will see the first set of people who appropriated the title Lord were not Jacob's children, Esau's children call themselves lords. It's of the flesh. It's not of Israel. It's not of God. All those who are young, all those who got a call of God upon your lives, those who want to be chosen, learn now to serve. Learn now to serve. That's how we learn. That's how we were taught. We were taught tough. That's how we were taught. I'm telling you, that's, that's how we learn. Clean, 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 clean. Sweep, 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 sweep. Mop, 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 mop. Go for prayer meeting. If you're only one alone, still go, 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 go. You don't have to wait. If my friend comes, I will go. No, you will go alone. You know why? Because even one can put a thousand to flee. Two comes, praise God. But if nobody comes, will you go? A servant will go. Have you heard any servant saying, only if that servant comes, I will go, master? Have you heard? No, they will not say. Yes, I will go. If he comes, fine. He says, can I take him also? The Lord will say, no, you go alone. Okay, you go alone. But you know what? We are not servants at heart. We say, if Abel doesn't come, Eric will not go. If Yash doesn't come, Eric will not go. You can't say that. If my wife doesn't come, I will not go. Servants go. Servants serve. Full stop. No excuses. Otherwise, all that we have learned and heard for three years is going waste. Because we haven't found the purpose for which it was sent. To ascend so that we may be servants. Amen. I want the worship team to come. And as we stand up, let's sing this song together. Come worship team. Let's sing this song together. Can you go back home today? If you are a man and a husband, say, I am the chief servant. If you are a wife, say, I am the assistant servant. And if you are children, say, we are all servants. Let our home be where we all serve. And then you will see what this song means. That power of God is to be servants. That power is given us, O oh God, that we may serve, serve you, serve one another, O oh God. That's the power that is released. Because you are a servant. Holy Spirit, you come to us as a servant. And you expect all of us as your children to be servants. Because this is not the kingdom of the world. This is the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God there are only servants. Servants who are children. And children who are servants. Father I pray. This year you will teach us to serve. Serve you without complaining. Serve you without bitterness. Serve you without grudging. Serve you with a cheerful heart, O oh Master. Because you truly love a cheerful giver. Holding nothing back, O oh Master. Arising, laying aside all those garments that we hold on to. We will also gird a towel around our waist. And take that basin, that water. And we too, Lord, will wash Help us to be servants of God. Help us to be servants. To serve more and more and more people. 
so that your word will reach the ends of the earth. That more and more souls will come in. They will all come in. The orphans, the widows, the prostitutes, the pimps, the drug addicts, the drug dealers, the prisoners, they will all come in. Because we are willing to serve you and serve them, O oh God. Because they too are your children. And the table is set. The chairs are ready. The feast is ready. You're waiting for the children to come home. Help us to serve, O oh God. Help us to serve. No excuses this year. No excuses to serve you, God. We'll be found at our post. Wherever you have called us. Wherever. In our darkest hour, we will still bring spices, O oh Lord, to you. Thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, for these three years. The way you have sustained us, each one of us, as a church, all the other churches, all the other pastors, all the other ministries. We thank you, we praise you. Help us, O oh God, to be more and more like you. To serve. To serve cheerfully. Thank you, Father. Praise you, worship you, God. May give you glory and honor. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us. Amen.